of what we've seen was was only about George. It is about George, but George touched something deeply the way he died. Just last year before COVID, we had 140 million people in this country poor and low wealth, 43 percent of this nation. 700 people a day dying from poverty. And too many people in high places were too comfortable with other people's death. Since 2016, we've had 30, almost 40 presidential debates. Four million people live, live every day. They can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. When has there been a full debate on poverty? Then COVID hits. And we have all of this inept, negligent reaction from the White House and, and the Senate. We see corporations get trillions of dollars up front. In the midst of a pandemic, we don't address health care. In the midst of a pandemic, we don't provide living wages. In the midst of a pandemic, we don't guarantee sick leave. In the midst of a pandemic, we don't deal with adequate unemployment. Oh, but we did something. We did something. We're applauding ourselves, too many of us, for doing it. We decided that people were essential. Okay. As though they weren't essential before. And then what happened to George happened. And black and white and brown, all people, when he said, I can't breathe, it was as though people took up that and said, I know, I can't either, we're dying too. Just like that cop had his knee on the neck of George, all these policy needs are on top of us. So in a season of death, we on top of that see the system clearly murder someone and it's too much. And then the president's response and the way in which the authorities didn't immediately arrest him, this man, poured salt in the wound. But the protests, I believe, are bigger than just about George. The energy and the power and the ethic of those protests are saying, wait a minute, we're not ready yet to give up on this democracy. That's what you see in the street. It's the democracy trying to breathe and refusing to allow the policies of injustice to crush and suffocate our reality. Reverend Barber, so many things have come together. Poverty, joblessness, the pandemic, police brutality, racial injustice, all these things that you've talked about. Now that people are awake, what is the path forward? Well, number one, let's hope that we're fully awake because there's still some people that want to deal with this as though racism, this racism is a spectacle. And if you just fix what happens in Minneapolis, you just arrest these people and charge them, then that's all we need to do. When in fact, even George's life is the antithesis of that. He was an essential worker, he needed money, he needed health care. So we have to be careful in this moment that we do not see all of this energy and just say once to get a rest in Minnesota and maybe conviction, then that's fine. We have to see this moment as a time for fundamental shifting. We must not just deal with who did this, but what. What made that cop think he could do that to George is, is still a part and parcel of our society where too many people think they can use their power to, to crush people, right, rather than lift people. So we must make sure this moment is not wasted. That's the way forward. Number two, we must decide that there are five interlocking injustices, systemic racism, ecological devastation, poverty, the war economy, and militar militarization of our communities, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And we must understand these interlocking injustices require a moral fusion intersectional response people of all different races and creeds and color that say, we're not just gonna see these issues in silos. The hope lies in us facing these issues, using this moment, and we're gonna have to face it because we will have a depression. There's no way around that, but you do not have to die there. There's a way out, there's a policy way out. And that's why our campaign, what we're saying to people, we must change the narrative. And what I mean by changing the narrative is we gotta put a face on this. We gotta put a face on those 140 million people and those 700 people dying a day. That's what George was a face, but we gotta put a face on the other problems. And then we have to build power. Because right now in this country, poor and low wealth people will hold the key to the political calculus change in this country. If poor and low wealth people organize around an agenda and vote, they can fundamentally shift the politics even in the South. We gotta believe that it's possible. We can't live in it's not possible. We have to have an agenda, a new deal, a third reconstruction. It can't just be the same old, same old. And in COVID, we may not get mail-in ballots for everybody. So people are gonna have to listen, risk their lives to vote. 
Here's what I've said to Democrats particularly. If you want people to risk their lives to vote, you must give them agenda worth risking it for. See, that's why people were willing to risk their lives in the civil rights movement and be possibly be lynched or beaten on a bridge because they believed that, that fighting for that Voting Rights Act was worth their life if it made their life or their children better. What was your reaction when President Trump walked over to St. John's Church for that photo op? I thought it was a gross form of public idolatry and a form of heresy that he would use the military to run people away, innocent people, peaceful protesters, run them even off of the platform of the church area so that he could go and do a prop. The only reason he needed to go to that church was to repent. And he didn't do that. And it's obscene in the way in which he tries to hold the Bible up, either doesn't know what's in it or does know what's in it, but refuses to abide by it. But it's not his fault alone. It's all of his enablers, the way in which McConnell and the Senate enable him, the way in which his cabinet enable him, the way in which this attorney general enables him. It's all of the so-called white evangelicals that pray for him, P-R-A-Y, while he is praying, P-R-E-Y, on the very people that Jesus, for instance, said a nation will be judged by how it treats them, the poor, the sick, the immigrant, the children, the women, and the least of these. But it's not new. Slave masters did the same thing with the Bible to pro try to justify slavery. Segregationists did it. But this is the card that Trump is playing, and he's not playing it alone. His advisors are telling him to play it. And what he wants to do, he's fanned these flames. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. He wants to run on this false notion of law and order. He wants us not to pay attention on all his failures. He wants us to focus on what he calls hoodlums and the thugs, when in fact of the matter is, his presidency has been one of the most thuggish in history. His presidency has been one of the most violent in terms of public policy in history and the number of people who've been hurt both physically and politically and through policy. And we in Americans have to say that he and his enablers, you're not fooling us. Part of the reason we're seeing all that we're seeing is because of all of the non-violent protests that have been ignored. And that's why I say America ought to say, thank God that people are in the street and in these great multitudes of people. And the, and the young people went to the Lincoln Memorial and sat down and they started singing and standing there. Thank God, why? Because number one, that's a sign that a lot of people haven't given up on this democracy. Number two, it's a sign that there's still in this democracy a whole host of people that refuse authoritarianism and dictatorism and fascism and any other kind of ism that tries to take away our, even our hope for being one nation under God, indivisible and with liberty and justice for all. And then third, thank God they're there because there is a worse violence to see a lynching on TV and say, no, that's not we can do. To see the attacks on the poor and the sick and the broken and the immigrant and women and on black people and just say, oh well. To experience all of this unnecessary death and just go home and say, well, as long as I'm not dead, it's fine. The screams, the prayers, the mourning, all of that that we're seeing is the hope of the yet unfulfilled possibilities of this nation. I pray that it translates at the ballot and I'm gonna to work towards that. On June 2020, we're gonna put in front of this nation the people and a policy agenda, because I don't believe you should ever curse the darkness without presenting to the light. And I also say in this moment, politicians that want to see them turn out at the ballot box, better not misinterpret this moment. Better not think that all they need to do is say, we're getting along. Because if that's all we're gonna do after Trump, it's just going to go back to being nice while injustice lives, going back to just be too many people being comfortable with other people's death and desperation, it's not what we need. We need transformation. I believe we will not be the same after this pandemic and after this season of mass or nonviolent protest. We cannot be the same. If we are, God help us. But I believe, and these folk in the street tell me, and this movement I'm a part of tells me, that it's not over for the possibilities in America, but we gotta fight for it.